Hello everyone, welcome to the Force Plate Coach YouTube channel. My name is John McMahon and in this video I'm going to talk about how we can identify the jump start from our Force Plate data using robust Force Plate methods. Now to maximise the view on the screen I'm going to dip my webcam just so we can have a look at the different graphs that I'm going to show you during this video and then I'll catch back up with you at the end of the video where we have a closing message. So what I'm going to show you is a five step process in how we identify the jump start. So first of all, we need to identify where the athlete remains still during at least that first one second where we collect the data. So what you can see by that large arrow pointing down is that in that initial one second at least of this collection of force data, the athletes remain still. The reason we know that they're still is because we've got a nice horizontal line that's going across past that one second part marker that you can see on that time axis, on the, on the horizontal axis. Um, as soon as the athlete begins to move, you can see that change in force. Obviously movement doesn't occur until force has been produced and so therefore you see that reflection as soon as the athlete begins to move just before the two second mark, so about 1.7 seconds in give or take, uh, that the athlete has started to move because you've got a reduction in force that we call the unweighting phase and I'll explain the different phases of the counter movement jump in a later video. So the important thing is, is first, like I've mentioned in my previous videos, identify where the athletes remain still make sure they've done that for at least a second. The next job then, in alignment with my previous video, is that we can calculate the athlete's body weight and we do that as the average force over that one second where they remain still. Now in my examples that's going to be that initial first second but I did mention in some of my early videos that if you've weighed the athlete for more than one second then you just need to identify a period just prior to the movement beginning where the athlete has remained still for that one second period and we kind of stick to that one second weighing assuming that the data has been collected at 1000 Hz. So in this example that grey horizontal line in this zoomed in force trace that we've got now if you didn't notice the horizontal, uh, sorry the vertical axis has now been rescaled so we're really focusing in, in and around where that athlete's been weighed. So that horizontal line in grey represents that average force in this case of 766 newtons and that's what represents the athlete's body weight in this example. To move forward then and to use that first second to identify the jump start, we need to consider the standard deviation of the force over that same one second where the athlete's been weighed. So all we do is instead of calculating the average, so if you're using Excel and I will show you how to do that, you might use equals average and select that one second period. This time we can calculate the standard deviation over that same period. So again, if using Excel, it'll be equals STDEV, open your bracket, select that data over which that one second's occurred and, and hit enter. That's gonna give us one standard deviation. We multiply that by five to get this five standard deviation threshold. And that five standard deviation threshold gives us a really confident bandwidth uh, that we're hoping that when the athlete stood still, that that force data will not surpass and it will only surpass that five standard deviation threshold when the athlete actually commences that jump and movement has therefore occurred. And that is really uh, a threshold that's used because of the work of Owen et al in 2014. So if you've not checked out that paper, I'll, I'll put it in the link in the description of this video. Go and check that out because that is a criterion method for calculating uh, different parameters from a counter movement jump fourth time trace and that was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So the way that looks for us is that we calculate that five standard deviation threshold and that will create an upper and lower bound force threshold. So in this example, one, sorry, five standard deviations above the body weight of 766 newtons here is equal to a value of 774 newtons and five standard deviations below is equal to a value of 756 newtons. So we've got a fairly robust upper and lower bound force interval that we're then going to try and explore to see when that force is actually surpassed. So if we do that now, we then take a scan through that force data to find that very first force data point that in this case goes below that lower bound five standard deviation force threshold. So in other words, we're looking for the very first data point in our force time record beyond after which the athlete has been weighed that that upper or lower bound force threshold has been surpassed. Now some athletes will commence the counter movement jump with a preliminary increase in force and so you might see the opposite to what you're seeing on the screen here and that upper bound force threshold of 774 newtons might be surpassed. In most cases athletes are going to commence that on waiting phase and reduce their force below their body weight and so you most likely see 
that's 756 newton in this example, uh, lower bound force threshold being surpassed. Once we've scanned through and we found that, obviously the athlete has already begun to move. And I have said in the previous videos that the assumption when we commence our uh, forward dynamics procedures is that the athlete is remaining still and upright on the force plate. So because that threshold's already been surpassed, the athlete has already commenced that movement. And so what we then need to do is a step five, where we do a backward search to identify the last value that represents body weight, and that is where the jump start has commenced. And then you can begin your numerical integration at this point. Alternatively, I've got an alternative step five here. You can do a backward search to 30 milliseconds before that first force value crossed that upper or lower band force threshold. Okay, and that might not coincide exactly with that average body weight. That second step five option is in line with what Owen et al. put forward in Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research in 2014, and that is the most broadly used robust force value, I would say, for identifying the jump start in the scientific literature. But that initial step five is what some of us have been starting to use within our own research uh, and doing that backward search to body weight. So I would say that either of those approaches would be considered acceptable. Um, so hopefully that's something that the software that you're using with the force plates that you have has currently got embedded into their system. Or if you're going to analyze the data yourself, and like I say, I will provide an Excel tutorial on how to do this. So you're welcome to use that too. You'll be using one of those two force thresholds or you can select a function where you can switch between the two depending on what it is that you want to use forward. The point is, is that by considering the signal noise and creating that five standard deviation force threshold above and below the athlete's body weight, it gives us confidence that we are beginning our numerical integration at the point at which the athlete is still remaining still just before they commence to jump. And that's wherefore, uh, whereby we would then calculate the net force and then the acceleration, velocity, displacement, power, so on and so forth from that point. It's just super important that the athletes have remained still at that point. A lot of the early research has used arbitrary thresholds to determine when the jump has commenced. So they might go for a standard 10 newtons above or below body weight or 20 newtons above or below body weight. The problem is, is that doesn't account for signal noise and it also doesn't account for different weights of athletes that are actually taking, uh, doing the test on the force plate system. So for example, it'd be quite easy for a 120 kilo forward in rugby to surpass a 10 newton threshold versus a child that maybe weighs at 500 newtons. So having something that does consider the signal noise is, is definitely considered to be the criterion way of analyzing the jump start. So thank you for watching the video. I hope you found it useful. I know some of this stuff can be a little bit dry in terms of the methods and how we actually calculate different parameters such as a jump start using robust force plate measures, but it is super important to make sure that we get the most out of our data. So hopefully you found it useful. I will follow up this video with an Excel tutorial on how you can actually do these calculations yourself. So keep an eye out for that. You can do so by subscribing if you haven't done already. For those that have, again, thank you for your continued support. My Twitter and Instagram handles are at the Force Play Coach. If you do have any questions about this video or indeed any of the other videos that I've done so far, then please feel free to reach out and I'll get back in touch with you as soon as I can.